Well, my little seeds, it looks like I've come to finally pollinate you. Hope you're ready to get pollinated, bitch. So, I've been considering the possibility of making a new series for a long time. I've made a lot of videos about the disturbing movie Pipeline, which is a nice and fancy way of saying that sometimes when you start watching horror movies, over the course of time, people start pushing you into watching more and more real death videos and torture. Those, as we all know, are not necessarily the height of cinema. I would like to start that new series, and that series will be called What the Films? WT Films, I guess. I'm not very creative, and the name probably won't last. It might even change. But more than anything, I just wanted to do a series that was highlighting things that were a bit edgier, but not necessarily like real death footage, but also had a lot to say, and I felt like in our current situation, with everything going on, it would be nice to talk about art in some sort of meaningful way, especially if it had anything whatsoever to do with our lives and how to make those better. Because I don't know about you, but my life is kind of a nightmare. <laughs> So we're going to figure it out together. Doesn't that sound great? And if you like this series, you've got to actually drive the whole thing because nowadays the algorithm is pretty much devoted to likes, comments, and subscriptions. So if you don't interact with the video, it probably won't get seen by anybody, which kind of sucks. So if you want to make that better, might I recommend liking or commenting? Shit, you can even comment about how cute I am. I'm not going to turn down a compliment. I'm needy and I'm insane. So I figured that the first and foremost, most important film that we need to talk about on a what the films sort of show is The Holy Mountain, directed by Alejandro Jodorowsky. Now, if you'll remember, many, many years ago, I made a video about The Holy Mountain that kind of blew the fuck up. And that's why I even have a YouTube presence whatsoever. So hello to you who probably watched The Holy Mountain video years and years and years ago and are now wondering who the hell this girl is that's standing in front of you and why she sounds very similar to the one that you knew earlier. Life sometimes happens. It gets in the way. We've all seen Jurassic Park. That aside, let's talk about The Holy Mountain, but again, only this time with like a decade of experience between then and now. When I made that video before, yeah, I was living with my parents. I was living at my mom's house while I was going to college, and I was only like my first year into college. I didn't know a goddamn thing about anything. Since then, I both completed a dual major in film and video and in art history, so I know a thing or two about a thing or two. I've experienced a lot more marginalization and a lot more trauma, which this film is also about political and religious groups and their leaders and how these things just can't be trusted anymore. And also, could they have ever been trusted in the first place? And also, what is the legacy of these things and white supremacy? A thing that we're now openly, actively talking about all the time. We are experimenting with a drug to create delusions of grandeur. I hear that Alejandro Jodorowsky is probably canceled because of that thing he said about the movie that he made before this one called El Topo, where he said that he uh, attacked a woman to make that movie, which kind of sucks. Don't do that. Because he is a marginalized man from Chile talking about world political issues, we're going to give him a little listen, and we're going to let his film speak for himself. Because whether Alejandro Jodorowsky is a good dude or a bad dude doesn't really matter to my life. He's He's never gonna read my tarot, I read my own tarot. However, I will absolutely hear him out, only briefly, while on LSD. So the first thing to note about the Holy Mountain is a context thing. Fairly easily forget about, but it's very important to note. This film is now widely available. You can head over to the internet and Google it, and there it is. Or you can go to Amazon Prime and order it. It might even be on Prime for like free. And if it isn't, it's like what? Free dollars you can do three dollars that's like half of a coffee nowadays that's not even a happy meal anymore for christ's sake access is endless there's so much of it and you're not going to run out of it anytime soon but there was an important time where for decades the holy mountain was made was seen by a few shelved and disappeared it wasn't really available on physical media and the reason it wasn't available on physical media primarily was because physical media didn't really 
really exist for a long ass time and people have a tendency to forget about that. There was a time where if you didn't see it in the theater, you watched it on TV and they're not gonna play The Holy Mountain on TV. So congratulations, you're not gonna see the movie. The rights of this film were owned by George Harrison's estate having to do with the Beatles. And then of course the Beatles have a gigantic history of rights disputes and whether or not these things were allowed to be seen by the public whatsoever. I would call it a cult classic, but more than that, it was just simply missing. It was a legendary film, a relic of a time lost, a, a film that no one could see and everybody endlessly speculated about what's in that movie. So for the longest time, this movie existed entirely as myth. Knowing that brings the context of this whole situation just right to head. When you watch the film now, you kind of miss out on this aspect of like it being a special thing. It's not to say that this is a special thing because nothing is truly special, but I will say that the Holy Mountain is a psychedelic mecca that you have to approach yourself. Nobody really ever in the echelons of history was like, hey, I got uh, this movie, The Holy Mountain. I ain't heard of it. I rented it at Blockbuster and I just figured I'd sit down and watch it with my parents. That kind of shit does not happen, did not happen, and is not in our future. So while there is this re-emergence of a lot of like older 70s and 80s, almost lost movies, the, the ultimate lost movie is the one that you, on your own volition, must seek out and experience for yourself. And if you're going to watch The Holy Mountain, you're gonna watch it for one of two reasons. Number one, you heard that it's the weirdest movie ever made, and you heard pretty right. And number two, you have come to the film seeking understanding. Where a decade ago, I found The Holy Mountain and was able to watch it and went, holy shit, this is the weirdest movie I've ever seen and I don't understand it whatsoever. Then I did 10 years of, well, let's call them drugs. And then I came out the other side going, I would like understanding. I'm going into this movie looking for answers about my spiritual and political reality. It is a very different experience approaching the film more or less as an adult than approaching it as like a teenager who heard that it was shocking and weird. But for the most part, the conversation around this movie for the last decade that I have seen is that it's shocking and weird, which is really, really bizarre because more than anything, it is the most political and openly critical of religion film I have ever seen in my whole life. There is truly no movie like it, no movie speaks the same language. And I would argue that there is not a film that is even clearer than this when it comes to these issues. See, most films have this weird, like, Disney thing going on. We're all about creativity. We're not creatively saying the thing that we feel. We're creatively distracting people from the major issues and trying to stamp down their desire for violence, change, revolution, anything like that. But Alejandro Jodorowsky has done LSD uh, a lot, so he knows for a fact that change is really truly the only currency of life whatsoever. So he's not out here trying to make a pleasing film. It's not a movie that's trying to make you happy. And honestly, thank God, I'm sick and tired of bullshit in this world trying to make me feel happy when what I actually feel is confused. It's good, actually, to experience things that kind of massage your anger. So with that, we can finally talk about Alejandro Jodorowsky's third film, The Holy Mountain, what exactly it even the fuck is. So it's the 70s. It's 1971, in fact. There is a new film playing at your local midnight movie theater, which is more or less known for weird art house films and pornography. So if you like exploitation, which is pretty much anything that sits in that weird echelon of weird art mixed with pornography, then congratulations. You found yourself at the right place and you will be watching a weird ass movie at midnight on LSD with your friends. Now I know that that sounds fucking amazing and it is a shame that Rocky Horror Picture Show is the only midnight movie 
movie, they still show like this. You can't even do drugs at it. A load of bullshit. But there was a time where we were seeking truth out there at the movie theater, at the midnight movie theater, and we found ourselves at the Holy Mountain. The Holy Mountain exists because the Beatles gave Alejandro Jodorowsky a million dollars to make whatever the fuck he wanted. El Topo, his prior film, was about a gunfighter who was trying to impress a woman, but when upon failing to impress the woman uh, by killing all these pseudo-religious gunfighters, uh, she leaves him for a woman, just destroys his ego, and thus he dies. But he doesn't actually die. He's reborn in a cave with a bunch of uh, people that are, have experienced physical deformities, and he decides he's going to free them from their situation. Unfortunately, freeing them from their situation puts them directly in view of the town nearby. And the town nearby is mostly racist and propagates capitalism and like a lot of really bad religious and political ideas. When the people enter the town, having been freed from their uh, situation, they are gunned down by the citizens. Uh, Alejandro Jodorowsky playing El Topo, the main character, covers himself in gasoline and then lights himself on fire. But only after completely destroying the situation and the society which caused this. So one might call that a statement. It was a very Chilean movie, pantomime clowny. And the reason there is because Alejandro Jodorowsky did not go to film school, he went to clown school. So clown college is more of his thing, pantomime, large expression. The point of doing large expression. It's literally to point at a metaphor and to say, there, there's the metaphor. It's right there. You can see it if you just look at it. It's a very blunt way of making movies, which is almost why it feels very non-auteur, even though it is the most auteur. Ultimately, Alejandro Jodorowsky is interpreting through physical artistic space and things. That in and of itself is such a confounding idea to our world that's mostly trying to portray true realism. So instead of portraying true realism, it psychedelically portrays real truth, how these things philosophically manifest. As I've already said, now that we're like half an hour into this fucking video, we can finally talk about what the Holy Mountain is about. So the Holy Mountain is broken into three chunks. Chunk number one, we follow a figure that appears to be similar to Christ, deals with the trials and tribulations of being a young Christ, having to do the things that Christ is expected to do, like Mark himself for situations, whatever, slowly over the course of time realizes that that's not really the role he wants to live in. He's not going to just lay down and die. Clearly, he has been cursed with life and thus must continue to live. He makes a friend, smokes some pot with that friend, and then they go into town. In town, he very quickly meets the group of Nazis that run money, and they hire him to be an entertainer, which is great. He entertains people by destroying frogs and lizards in a demonstration of colonialism while receiving money from a Nazi adheres to the way things are. He engages with the sort of microscopic hidden secret genocides that are going on all across his little nation. And he does so for money because in his mind, making money is the only thing you can really do, which is true of people that are born into this world and don't quite understand how capitalism manipulates them. So he's under the impression that money really is truly the only value. And because of this, he decides that he could get money from Taurus if he plays up the fact that he looks like Christ, carries around some crosses, lets people give him money as if he's sort of homeless and derelict, you know, a poor Christian looking fellow. So they sort of indulge him, if that makes sense, by giving him money. So he, he finds out that you can make money by doing uh, the work of the white supremacists who run society and entertain everybody and try to secretly get their shitty, terrible, racist ideas in there. Or you you can play up the, the dereliction thing, make money as like a, an impression of Christ, not with your working hands, but with what you represent as like a spiritual being to people who don't know you. <laughs> After which somebody goes, hey, he does kind of look like Christ. We should make a shitload of copies of him and then sell those copies. So they drug him, make him get drunk and shit and make a million copies of, of his image as if he were Christ. This makes him very upset as he does not want to be Christ. He would like 
like to be himself. But it's this weird moment where he screams, gets up, gets angry, and destroys his expectations, the things that are expected of his life, him being a martyr, him being like Christ. He abandons his desire to be like Christ. So he leaves and meets a bunch of nuns. And nuns in this universe are the women of God, which is to say they are like God's uh, concubines, more or less. So they're dressed all scantily clad and they're nuns. And to make matters worse, there are even children ones, which is a sad but true depiction of children having to immediately thrust themselves into the purposes of religion. Upon meeting these nuns and doing all these things, he takes the last image that he has of himself as Christ and eats it and lets it fly away, kind of representing the death of that spirit, the growth of despair, the creation of nihilism. To abandon his expectations, yes, but also the image that those expectations are contained wherein. And at this point, we just about reach part two of the movie. Our boy, who looks like Christ, finds this cool tower. And in the tower is a funky magician man. And oh boy, we love a funky magician man. But basically, essentially, the Christ-like figure sees the gold coming out of this tower and is like, ah, I love money and money is the thing I need to make. And I only know of the two ways to make money. And both of those ways like exploit me and hurt me deeply. Probably rather figure out where this gold is coming from as it seems to be coming apropos of nothing. So he rides the top of the tower and enters the tower, meets the magician man, and the magician man kicks his ass. At this point, I would call us moving on to part two of the film. So before we continue, let's take a quick breather. <laughs> Because there's, so, it's so much, like literally every scene of this movie is goddamn a whole video in and of itself. More or less, this first part is just talking about the human situation of being born on earth, wondering like, what is your purpose? But asking yourself what your purpose is has a lot of manipulations in there that you can't see. You know, what do they want you to be? What does society encourage you to be? What expectations were placed on you before you were even born? Before you even gained sentience in your own body? What does that actually mean? How does that manifest? How does that actually change your experience of life? So like interacting with society, it turns out, is a fucking nightmare. We all kind of behave as if we are not, but we all possess and carry with us an inner child that is terrified of all these things that we're experiencing, but we never really truly have the ability to just confront them directly or even see them. So often we're ushered through life to a certain point where we then have to go, wait a minute, I'm not not sure that I want to be doing what life is forcing me to do. And this is really the first big crisis of being alive. And it, it hits that mid 20s spot where you're like, okay, I, I did it. I went to high school, you know, I got my diploma or I went to the military. I did that. I, I went to college. I got my diploma there. I, I went and did all the things. Why am I still a slave to capitalism? Why am I still miserable? And why has nothing ever gotten any better? And with that, we can get into part two. Do you want gold? Yes. All right, kiddos, so part two of the Holy Mountain Time, and let me tell you what the fuck. This is where the movie goes from pretty neat and weird and difficult for just any human being to just casually understand to being really psychedelic. It says a lot of very openly political and difficult things for even sometimes our modern sensibilities to listen to. I find a lot of times that people will watch The Holy Mountain and they will go, oh shit, I didn't know that this movie was like a weird leftist thing. And it's like, yes. So as I previously stated, there is a wizard in the tower. His name is The Alchemist and he is played by Alejandro Jodorowsky, the director of the film. Now I know you're thinking, May, isn't it maybe slightly vain and narcissistic 
narcissistic to cast oneself as the guiding light force of the film that you yourself wrote. Yes, it turns out that super is true. It's funny, because this movie comes across very like, hi, I'm an egoless Zen master, and I'm going to tell you how the world is. But it's not that, and that is one thing that I think we should highly contest about the film, is that ultimately it is rather narcissistic to have done this. And while I do think that his purposes were pretty decent, I would also say that there is no way around the fact that he, this is like no different than like a Tommy Wiseau situation of being fucking I'm important. Now I'm not saying that like it's not important. He clearly says a lot of very important things and I also think uh, Yodorowsky as a person is an important figure you should probably know about. But at the same time, oh boy, what a narcissist to cast himself as the cool Zen master who understands everything. I mean, it's not like he could have cast anyone else, I guess. As I said, it is a low budget film given that it's like a million bucks for a psychedelic movie, which like is a lot at the time, but not really that much in the grand scheme of things. And considering all the things that they were able to do with that million dollars, it's kind of understandable. And also when you're like picking lead actors, it's cheap to go with your family and it's even cheaper to go with yourself. It's possible that a lot of this stuff came from ego. I think it's also equally possible. It was a limitation of the budget that they were dealing with at the time. Either way, the alchemist, the new cool character who's super gangster and OG, who we love, and we're gonna follow him around for a minute. So he kicks our main character's ass very deservingly because our main character was trying to steal from him. The alchemist is just like, hey, hi, I understand that you really want money. I can give you money all you want. Matter of fact, not only can I give you money, I can teach you how to get money, just produce it entirely yourself. I can teach you how to do that. Do you want to do that? And the guy's like, why, yes, I do. If you could please do that for me, that would be fantastic. He makes him shit in a small container. This is normal. People do this all the time. He shits in a small pot through the process of alchemy. He has to sit in a big tank and chill out with his shit in the tank with him. They begin to heat the shit. So then he's like sifting and chilling out in his boiling shit in a containment chamber where he has to smell it. And through this like long process of it going through his body, him like breathing it and then exhaling it and all this alchemical shit, it eventually becomes gold. The metaphor there is probably going to be lost on the majority of people. And this is not because it's super smarty pants, but because it's super vague. Uh, it's not that vague if you've ever experienced this sort of thing, but it's vague if you do not know what the fuck he's talking about. Why is he bathing in his own shit to make money? Ah, but understand that the creative process, the process of being a person that creates art based on sitting around with your own problems, stewing in them for days, weeks, months, years, and then eventually writing a song or a book like my book that I wrote because I was deeply in pain. The point is you ruminate on your shit and eventually pays you. You can take your problems, think about them for a really long time, then draft up some beautiful poetic thing about how miserable that was for you. And then all of a sudden, accolades and money just come right towards you. But that's rather unsatisfying and it deeply hurts your soul. <gasps> I find that when I sit around and ruminate in my own shit, my own problems, while gold is cool, it deeply hurts my soul. It smells very bad. <laughs> so I would highly not recommend doing that unless you have a scat fetish. And trust me, I've watched enough scat fetishism content to know that I am not really that into scat fetishism. I feel like if I was, I would be a lot more open about it. And I would probably know by now, given the amount of bullshit y'all motherfuckers have made me watch. I'm into furry porn, you weirdos. In ruminating on his own shit, making a bit of gold, he's like, cool. But then the alchemist is like, hey, let me tell you a little secrety poo. How about that? You right now are shit. I can make you into gold. And then he shows him an image of himself in the mirror and he like picks up the gold that he had just made out of his own shit and throws it as, at his reflection, destroying his reflection. You are excrement. You can change yourself into gold. It develops this narcissistic self-deprecation. That's a big word, but it's it, it's not even one word, it's many words, but they begin to find themselves self-hating, almost 
for profit. It's this idea that, okay, yes, I understand I personally can be gold, I can be great, I can be content with myself and my own thoughts, but hear me out. What if instead of doing that, I continue to be shitty so that I continue to make money off of being shitty? But the alchemist like destroys this temptation and is like, okay, you broke the glass, now let's see if you can break a stone. If you can do such violence and such damage to your self, what can you actually do that's productive? So he tries with all his might to destroy this little rock thing and cannot do it. But then the alchemist just like hits it right on the top, it breaks in half, and then like he produces like this little ball thing and he's like, every stone has a soul. That I must admit, I don't entirely understand. Well, okay, that's not true. I do understand it, but it has a lot to do with Hinduism. Also, this movie has a lot to do with Hinduism, but I don't want to get into Hinduism too deeply on my channel because A, people are gonna rush into mansplain to me about how how I'm wrong about Hinduism, even though I have read the books. And B, because it's a religious thing and people hate when you talk about religious things. But I will say this much, everything is Brahmin, which is to say that even the soil itself or rocks, like even you, even the people you hate and the people you like, they're all the exact same organism. A stone has a soul. There is life in things that aren't alive. There is like an organic quality to the way that everything is and thus, we must respect and understand our world. Like we can't take advantage of nature while understanding how to functionally use nature. Formed by the work of millions of years. So then uh, he takes him into a room that's spinning and he's like, check out tarot. Let me teach you about tarot. Tarot is a big subject. It would take me hours to explain tarot to you. It is my one unmonetized hobby. It is the one thing that I do personally for myself that I feel has such value that I would feel like a bitch and a monster if I went on the internet and began selling people on tarot. It's not a good vibe. I don't like it. Now, if you're the kind of person that does tarot readings online for money, and I have no problem with you whatsoever, but I'm not going to do it because it is my one hobby that I feel like I must protect from money. <laughs> the fish thinks about his hunger, not about the fisherman. It is the master who seeks the disciple. We're talking about society, but we're not talking about society as in how people interact with each other, but we're more talking about the people who steal from the larger population and how they go about doing that. Now, this part of the film gets so complicated that honestly, you might need to take notes. I personally have taken notes. Okay, so the first planet is Venus and it has to do with cosmetics, like the cosmetic industry. Many of these are like planet representations, which also have something to do with like astrological shit, which admittedly I don't know an awful lot about, but that all also has to do with tarot. So they're kind of weirdly all married together in this weird alchemy bundle. Venus as a planet being entirely about cosmetics is talking about how there is a dude who runs a cosmetic industry. Which, think a Jeffree Star or something like that, let's just say. And he can pretty much sleep with whoever he wants because he's in charge of selling women the concept of the tools they need to be beautiful. So if he's the arbiter for what is and isn't beautiful, everybody for whatever reason wants to sleep with him. And of course, sleeping with him, everybody is like, well, clearly he loves me. He's going to date me forever. This is not true. It turns out he's dating hundreds of people. And the only reason he's dating them is because he's putting babies in all of them and starting weird fucking franchises. So it's not in any way about love. And it's also not about the celebration of beauty. It's about the exploitation of women. And beyond that, it goes further to also suggest that surgery and fa new faces and new bodies and, you know, making all these alterations to the, to the natural world obviously can be very validating for many people and there's definitely been a ton of very successful reconstructive surgery. Let me tell you what, I want some too. But in this circumstance, he's literally saying like, you know, there's no reason why you need to have a human body that is in any way remotely different from the human body you have to continue to be respected. And any 
anybody who's selling you on that is literally exploiting you for money and sex. And just to wrap it all up in a nice little bow, he's even like, look, we can even do miracle things to people in their coffin so they can perform their own last rites, take their top off and do a hot little dance, all kinds of stuff right there in the grave. Ah, comfort and how it is often used to exploit us. And that becomes the theme of part two of the Holy Mountain. The next planet is Mars. Mars is this cool lesbian lady who's bald and powerful and carries around a bunch of weapons and has dogs and wears a pantsuit. But the more important part about all this, she is a weapons manufacturer and her entire bit is trying to come up with weird weapons that will encourage people to kill each other instead of actual progressive war. They're not doing any of this for the right reasons. They're doing this for specifically the purposes of manufacturing more war, taking any group and instigating violence within that group to sell them weapons. Gun manufacturers, weapons manufacturers. We don't really hang out with those people. We don't have a tendency to see them, but they are openly profiting off of the violence going on in the country and in the world at any given time. And no one for any reason ever points at them and goes, hey, maybe we don't. We often think about how wrong war is, but we don't take it the step further and realize that war is incentivized by capitalism and these things are all together in a nice little bundle. And isn't that fun? The young generation needs arms for its marches and sit-ins. The next planet is Jupiter, and this is an art dealer. So think Marvel or Disney. They have a new line every winter, and they're like, oh, we gotta have the new line out. What's it gonna be? Well, we're gonna take a bunch of hot, naked people, put a bunch of like paint on them, and just have them just flap their asses down on canvas. They're not really going to be using the medium of art to say anything. Actually, quite the opposite. They're changing the definition of art, being a thing that humanity has historically done to express its need for meaning, problems with reality, taking it away from the concept of message altogether and entirely turning it into a visual spectacle. So this has taken even further art projects that are very literally just naked people who have their faces and their like feet and hands covered and then you just walk over to them and fondle them. The only purpose of a lot of art is just to oogle at those of us that are prettier specifically for their bodies and it's entirely entirely objectification. And so it's objectifying people instead of allowing them to express themselves artistically. It's stealing the concept of art itself, replacing it with this like weird media literacy where what people really think makes something good or they think that they like is actually something that more or less is kind of blowing them and not necessarily the thing that is telling them the truth. All right, and then we get to my favorite planet, which is Saturn. Uh, this is the, the toy manufacturer. So she comes across like this circus clown who's super fun and everybody loves her and she's super great. But then the second that she's alone, she's, her veil comes down and she's very much like, hi, I'm scary Nazi looking lady. So she's like a spooky Nazi lady who walks around her big giant factory employed by pretty much marginalized people where they make toys. And the idea with making a toy is that they're making an object that they can then sell to a parent, give to a kid that will encourage the kid to grow up and maintain their position in society. This kind of gets to the big grander point. You know, we were in a room where the alchemist was telling a guy all about the different facets of life that are fucking him over or fucking us all over. Then we sort of realize in what he's trying to communicate is how we're all manipulated into being exactly who we are when we sat down to watch this movie. You, as a person, are affected by all of these elements that the film is now depicting for you and these elements are things that all plague our lives. So the war toy manufacturer, they make a comic book campaign, i.e. read that as like video game or a movie or a cartoon or anything like that, with the express purpose of demonizing the Peruvians and tells us what to do. We manufacture hypersexed brown native vampires. So for like decades, they teach kids what fun means is picking up a gun to kill Peruvians with pleasure because they've already been trained to do so so successfully by 
pop culture. Now I know that you're thinking Call of Duty doesn't use brown people as the antagonists anymore. This is a real phenomenon. This is a thing. This is not like not a thing. This is if y'all have not yet reappraised your childhood for all the bad messaging that was secretly hiding in all of that kid entertainment and how that encouraged you to be maybe more angry, more aggressive, more violent, more politically closed-minded, more bigoted, things like that. You should do that. It's time. You've got to do that. That's a pretty important part of, you know, the whole making your ego work thing. The next one is like a weird aristocrats joke, and I don't exactly know whether or not Yodorowsky thinks that he's a funny dude, but he's kind of funny sometimes. The planet Uranus, which is a guy that lives with his mother and probably also fucks his mother. They do all kinds of weird, terrible shit together that's just like disgusting, uh, gross. <laughs> now, she has a merkin that's green. I don't understand. The boy who is living with his mother and they have this whole thing is actually the financial advisor for the president. I am financial advisor to the president. And the president kind of is like, we need to kill a certain amount of people in the next little time. Have you finished the report? Mm -mm, no or else we're going to be economically in dire straits. Our financial advisor is like, ah, oh, yes, well, let us gas uh, schools and children and families and poorhouses and hospitals. Let's just gas all these places. Begin the operations of the gas chambers, gas schools, gas universities, gas libraries, gas museums, gas dance halls, and gas whorehouses, etc. The financial people don't actually give a shit about anything other than making the money and fucking their mother. Because they're doing all that, they're not paying attention to the fact that they just told the president to kill a whole shitload of people, and then he did. So who's really at fault? Everyone, it turns out. Then we get to the other spicy planet. Neptune is the chief of the police. This is not a joke. I'm not shitting you. Literally, at this time in history, somebody was like, hello, a cab. I would like to tell you about that. So our boy, Alejandro Jodorowsky, portrays the chief of police as being this guy with the biggest chin, the coolest mohawk, and the biggest gun. And he runs kind of a weird manhood cult where, like, yes, they're policing, like, the citizens, but mostly that's for the purposes of policing the young men in society, encouraging them to leave society or leave their family, leave the life of love and luxury behind, and move on to this kind of private life with the chief of police where he cuts off your balls and puts them on the wall with the other balls. This is the most beautiful day of your life. Of your own free will, you came to surrender part of your body to me. And I know you're thinking there's no way that that happens, but yes. Your sacrifice completes my sanctuary of 1,000 testicles. He does have a room of 1,000 testicles where he keeps all of the balls that he has ever been given. He is a, a testicle collector, one might say. So isn't that neat? Turns out the the police are a manhood cult. They're, they're more or less manifesting an aspect of yourself, which is like self-policing. You go there not to police other people, but to police yourself because you're afraid that you yourself are not going to experience some level of morality without some dude taking your testicles away, having to give up their lives for this stupid idea of crime. And then when you see what crime is, it's literally just people peacefully protesting their government. People get together, they're peacefully protesting their government, and the chief of police is like, let's send in the castrati to go fuck them up. And then they do. Great. All right, and then the last and final planet that we are shown is Pluto. And the bit with the architect is that he kind of like has his private happy life in his giant spacious place with all of his weird children. And then he goes to a big ball gathering thing where he's like, hello everybody, I have the new housing plan. And everyone's like, oh boy, ooh woo, what's your new housing plan, my dude? So we make a building filled with just coffins. And then the people get in the coffin to sleep. And if they die when they're sleeping, well, we just take the coffin out and bury it, easy. We don't have to and it makes it easier. So landlords are fucking garbage. But anyway, before that happens, he brings out a giant ice statue to impress everyone in the room. Of course, the giant ice statue is of a big penis. Hello, I have an ice sculpture. You must think that I have a big penis. And if you think I have a big penis, then you must agree with me that the housing plan looks pretty good. And by pretty good, I mean we're gonna put everyone in coffins and then they're gonna live in a coffin. So if 
you've ever noticed how your housing turns a little bit more and more into this weird landlord special of like white cum looking material? One might say that that could be because your landlord is a piece of shit and trying to fuck you out of your money. Living on the planet could and probably should be free given the fact that I was born here and I didn't choose this. Even if it was slightly more reasonable, that would be nice, but instead it's exuberantly expensive and we all live in a weird little coffin. Isn't that just exciting? Don't you love that? Now that you're properly pissed off about all the other weird rich assholes in society that are currently ruining your life, there is a solution. Alejandro Jodorowsky suggests that we get all of them together into a little room uh, who are running everything and we tell them, we trick them, we tell them that they're going to find immortality. Now this is the thing that everybody is seeking, supposedly, right? The rich, the billionaires, like, while they are fucking over our every day and our every life, we are ultimately slaves to their wealthy desire to find immortality. The alchemist is just like, hello, my dudes, I can give you immortality, you just had to ask. Burn your money. The alchemist is like, all right, we're gonna all sit in a room with a big fire and you're gonna burn your money, all of it. You're gonna burn all your money. Except for our main character, remember him, uh, who we're now going to refer to as the thief, only has like two, three dollars and he slaved away to earn them. It really hurts to give away his very little, but for everybody else, it's almost nothing for them to give away their millions because they know that they can get more millions. There's obviously this intense, specific class divide between one member of the group and the remainder of the group. The alchemist is going to take them all up the holy mountain. And at the top of the holy mountain, they will be meeting with the immortals. The immortals sit around a table that is shaped like the Enneagram. Sort of, I guess they talk about reality. I don't really know what they do. But the general idea is that they silently are immortal. As a group, going to climb the holy mountain, kill them, and take their immortality. If they do this, then they themselves will become immortal, replacing the immortals, and then they will go on to live a forever life until somebody eventually stabs them in the, in the back. Ah, oh, well, it turns out the grave gets us anyway. And that is the end of part two. Part three begins right at the start of our journey. And the start of our journey is a spicy one. We're going to be cutting off all of our hair, burning effigies of ourselves, losing our names, losing our ability to identify ourselves individually, and then doing ayahuasca in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> They go to like crazy places, uh, some like amazing historical and architectural places, and they do ayahuasca together. They lose their ability to see themselves as individuals. They all go through this sort of forcible ego death where they become a dog in search of the sacred flower, in search of the sacred water. The delicate scent of flowers is the fragrance of the universe. They become a collective being. As a collective being, they no longer feel the pull of selfness. They're no longer feeling selfish or like they need to protect themselves. So ironically, in doing this, they come to terms with their death. Surrender what you hate, what you desire. You will know nothingness. It is the only reality. The grave is your first mother, and your body is alone. Rich billionaire fucks are now being tricked into undergoing ego death. Holy shit, I'm gonna die, you're gonna die, we're all gonna die, but we're actually part of this big collective being. So if we're all here for together and for each other, we really shouldn't harm each other or fuck each other over or exploit each other or try to make money. Money is silliness because life as a currency has nothing to do with money. And so so they have all these gigantic epiphanies and then Alejandro Jodorowsky sits them all in a circle and says, okay, there is one person missing. I would like you to look in this bucket of water and see if you can find them. And so each person individually picks up the water, sees themselves, their reflection in the water and they go, oh no, she drowned. <laughs> Alejandro Jodorowsky realizes that they have all undergone ego death and they have all left themselves behind for the larger group. And at that point he can take them up the holy mountain. But the journey up to the holy mountain is a treacherous one. First, they have to get on a boat. And getting on a boat is weird because there's a bunch of children who are starving nearby. Do you want to perform miracles like Christ? See what would happen if you did. 
you know, like if you give them bread, they're going to get territorial and possessive with the bread. And then they're all going to kill each other over the bread instead of just eating it. And because capitalism is so inherently built into people's psyches at this point, they don't really know how to receive a gift and share it. How do you help people that remain slaves to a society that you yourself are trying to free everyone from? So is it better to give them bread or is it better to give them freedom anyway? So they get on a boat and then uh, Alejandro Jodorowsky is like, yo, check this starfish out. If you throw a thing, if you just see the starfish, if that's the only target, then you'll never miss. Apropos of nothing, turns to the thief and says, you have a monster inside you. We must get it out. So uh, he performs a, a sort of weird spiritual surgery and his friend from the beginning of the movie that he smoked weed with comes out of his chest and he's like, oh, I've been harboring concept of, of helping someone who has it harder than me. I need to get rid of that. So he has to even get rid of his own empathy, like his own infantilized desire to help other people who he knows can help themselves because of his weird martyrdom complex, sees everybody else weirdly on this infantile scale, and thus he must be the arbiter for their help. This is a thing he must let go of. So he throws the little guy off the boat, and then there is that. That's done. Now we're on the island where the holy mountain is. We've finally done it. It's only been six hours and we're finally here. The first thing they encounter when they get there is the Pantheon Bar. <laughs> This is a bar of tons of people who have also attempted the concept of going to the Holy Mountain, or at least have flirted with it, but they only got halfway there. They did not actually go on top of the mountain. They just made it to the base of the mountain. These are people who are like, I'm very strong. I can like do a bunch of physical activities. And then they're like, well, have you done the Holy Mountain? And he's like, well, no, because I don't need to, because I know I can do it. So what's the point in actually doing it if I, if I know I can? And so then and then they talk to another guy and this guy's like, I can go through the holy mountain instantaneously, horizontally. And they're like, well, what about vertically? Can you go to the top of it? And he's like, no, only horizontally. From bottom to top, I can do. But anyway, I am a champion! Well, okay, that's not gonna fucking help anybody. So then they encounter a guy who's like, hello, I don't need to go to the Holy Mountain. The Holy Mountain exists in my poetry. And then they're like, well, weird, because your poetry sucks dick, my bro, my brother, my brother in Christ. Your poetry blows. <laughs> Our bees make honey, but your flies make shit. And then they encounter another man who's like, hello, I have LSD in great quantities. And as you know, LSD in and of itself is the holy mountain. It's the experience. You don't need anything other than just the LSD. So we just do LSD and that's all we do. We don't need to go to the holy mountain. We just do LSD. It's not really the best way to reach any kind of miraculous enlightenment. I think Jodorowsky is trying to say here is like, I am in no way saying that drugs are an end in and of themselves. Drugs are cool. You can use drugs to learn things. Just because you learn things doesn't necessarily mean they in and of themselves are a replacement for your personality. It's kind of like everybody has met that one college asshole guy who's like, yeah, bro, I did LSD and DMT and now no ego. <laughs> Dude, I doubt that, like, because <laughs> you sure are talking yourself up in this group of people to make them think that you're cool. A weird thing people with egos have a tendency to do, that all this shit is bullshit and they're gonna go climb the holy mountain for real. They start climbing the holy mountain. This is a difficult path to do. And there are several moments where they nearly die or they have to start sacrificing their bodies. The first stage is there's like this big rock and this uh, the, there's one person who's like, I'm going to fall and they're like, no, you're not going to fall. You have to fuck the mountain. Your clitoris against the mountain. You're terrified of success. And the person's like, excuse me, what do you mean? And they're like, no, you have to literally fuck the mountain. The mountain itself, if you love on the mountain, it will make you unintimidated and you can go up it. And so then they all sort of fuck the mountain. And because they fuck the mountain, they're able to get over the high part of it. Isn't that great? Although once they get over the high part, it starts snowing. And when it starts snowing, they start to get frostbite. One person's like, oh no, I've got frostbite on my hand. I'm going to, I, I don't know what to do. And they're like, you were never able to forget your body. And now the thing you love most is stopping you from reaching the top. 
You must sacrifice part of your body. Then the guy cuts his fingers off and they keep going. They keep on keeping on all the way until they get to the place where they look up the hill and they go, holy shit, there's the fucking immortals. They're at the top of the fucking place. They got the fucking Enneagram table thing and they're all chilling up there. Let's fucking go get them. The alchemist is like, okay, you've done it. I took you all the way here. I took you to the immortals. I brought you to the face of God and now I'm gonna leave because I don't actually really want to fuck with them. I just kind of wanted to bring y'all here. And so then they're like, huh, oh, but you're so cool. He's like, yeah, you don't need a fucking master. Y'all are your own master now. Yeah, y'all gonna figure it out. And so the group begins ascending to the immortals and the alchemist leaves. You can win by yourself. Goodbye. The thief goes with the alchemist and the alchemist is like, okay, you can cut off my head now. Cut off my head. So he takes a giant scimitar and cuts off his head, but then he turns into a lamb. A sacrificial lamb, one might say. And then Jodorowsky's like, you don't need to go fuck with the immortal thing. You don't need that shit. What you need to do is go back into Samsara and go be like I am, like a cool Zen master guy, a very Morpheus figure who pulls people out of the Matrix and shows them how fucked up it is inside there so that they can actually improve society. And so the thief's like, cool, you got it. See you later. And he leaves. The main character of the movie leaves. Our group of people, the sacred dog, if you will, they all attack the immortals, but the immortals are simply mannequins. So they remove all the mannequins except one who is the alchemist in disguise. And the alchemist is like, hello, everyone. Remember me from a moment ago? I'm back. And sitting at the table, he's like, okay, so here's the deal. Made you all accept your humanity. Made you all accept that you're going to die. That money is not going to save you. We came in search of the secret of immortality, to be like gods. And here we are, mortals, more human than ever. That exploiting people is wrong, that martyring yourself for people is futile and stupid, that basically every faith on the planet that's expecting you to do something for it is getting it wrong. Faith should be doing shit for you. <laughs> I, I hate to tell you this, but this is the end of the film. Zumba camera. And so they pull the camera back, revealing a crew of people, and then Alejandro Jodorowsky, the actual man, not the character, breaks character and is like, hello, I am the director of the film, The Holy Mountain, that you have just watched. I am now breaking the illusion to say to you, We must not stay here, prisoners. We shall break the illusion. If you actually want any of these things in this movie to matter, you personally have to embody them and go out into the world and actually spread that shit and be that shit, live this shit. It's not about dying here at the end of this movie because there is no end. Goodbye to the holy mountain. Real life awaits us. So it's our duty to make adjustments to reality, not necessarily our duty to comfortably find a finished spot. So the movie rejects its own ending, openly says no ending, no endings for stories. There is no point. You should take this shit home with you, think about this shit, and realize that yes, while I was telling you a story, I was doing it so loosely as to show you personally what the ramifications of reality actually are so that you can have some level of control over it. He's almost begging the audience to take back their like power and control from those that have stolen it entirely on a spiritual, mental, and emotional level and not even like on the inherent go attack people. The film even openly advocates that whenever you do something violent, somebody's making money off of you anyway. So, so the movie doesn't really present you with an awful lot of intense solutions. It has more of a tendency to provide you with a bunch of questions, a bunch of things that you really dislike about reality, the ability and the tools to change it, but not the actual change itself. So now that we're finished talking about the movie, the, the thing that I want to stress to you, as I said at the beginning of this video, The Holy Mountain is a movie that you used to have to seek out. You used to have to go find it. And when I say go find it, I mean, you would have to ask a friend of a friend of a friend if they had a bootleg tape of it, which most people didn't have because there really weren't very many of those until the film print was recently restored. 
bored. This was like a weird mecca of psychedelia. This was a movie that people watched and it, it distinctly changed their mind and their life and the way that they thought about things. It only does that if you already understand that it's going to do that. Like you have to go into the movie with the understanding that the movie itself will be providing you the understanding and at no point are you supposed to get too bogged down over the realism of what's being portrayed on screen. And so, unfortunately, we had an entire generation of people that saw this movie a long time ago, a decade ago, right when this thing finally got scanned to digital, and everybody watched it and went, wow, that was really weird. And nobody actually sat down and thought about the important ramifications, <laughs> the things the film was actually trying to say and do. Because of this, people never really evaluated their values. And I can't tell you how many times I have met somebody who's been like, hello, my favorite film is The Holy Mountain. I'm very smart and I'm a genius. What about The Holy Mountain do you like? Well, it's just the most politically relevant film of all time, which is true, but by far the worst person <laughs> is the person who's like, I really like it. It's very weird and I like watching it on drugs. I find that if you haven't watched this film and had some sort of profound understanding shift in your brain, you either already knew everything it had to say or you weren't listening. So I would recommend this time, if when you're going back for it this time, because I know that ev uh, as soon as this video ends, you are going to get off your ass, sorry, you're going to turn on this movie. And when you watch it this time, I want you to see it with those new eyes. I want you to really look at it and see what it's actually trying to say about life in tandem to do with politics. I feel like this is one of those movies that it deserves a discussion. It deserves an actual conversation whenever it's brought up. So frequently, it's brought up as like brownie points now to say that you're into cool, weird, experimental movies. Brownie points aside, it's very weirdly egoist. Let's think beyond that for only the briefest minute to say maybe we think about its ideas. I also return to my criticism that the film is very egotistical and very narcissistic on the point of Alejandro Jodorowsky, who decides to cast himself as the cool Zen master who knows all the things. If the film is genuinely arguing that we should not have satisfying cinema, really, it shouldn't please us. If movies aren't really meant to do much more than challenge us, wake us up, and piss us off, then I would say that uh, Alejandro Jodorowsky is more than anything sacrificing himself as this big image of this transformation. It's less of an egotistical, narcissistic thing and more of an actual act of image martyrdom. He's permanently forced himself to be the guy who did psychedelic shit. Really, no one should represent this idea in and of itself. And also, whenever anybody says psychedelic, they're usually thinking of like, do mushrooms and look at the ceiling or your hand or watch The Wizard of Oz with the Pink Floyd soundtrack. The concepts as presented very simply are samsara is the cycle of pain. You are born, which is painful. Uh, you are alive. This is painful. And then you die, also painful. It's a continuation cycle. It never seems to end. The only thing that we can really change is our maya, our imagined perception of what reality means. And if we can change it, then we can change the world. The Holy Mountain is a film that exists to change your maya, to confront you with the truth and then see how you deal with it. As always, I have been Mei Leeds, the person in charge for whatever reason of giving you some truth and then leaving you with it. So I I'm sorry to say, but I'm going to leave. I got shit to do. I got to go to the bathroom first off. This has been like over an hour of me standing here. I also uh, really want to go to a bookstore and walk around for no reason and drink coffee and have fun because that's what life's all about. Not spending money. It's about drinking coffee and having weird ideas ideas. And speaking of weird ideas, I wrote a book. It's filled with weird ideas. It's a uh, fiction and it's not, it's, it's really nasty, but this is the second version of it. This is a new copy edited version. It's very cool. I'm very, very happy with it. The spine is cute. The cute, it's, it's just generally cute. And I'm signing all these copies. There are links in the description. You can check it out. And as I said, if you like my weird ideas, I also made an album of music called Fish. Get that in there. I have a lot of albums of music, but this is my most recent. So check it out. It's on B 
Bandcamp at nickspheres.bandcamp.com. There are links in the description as well, so check that out. Also, thank you for liking, commenting, and subscribing, as those are the things that continue to get my video around in the algorithm, which would be nice. I think people would probably enjoy seeing me uh, more frequently. Consider giving me a dollar on patreon.com slash nickspheres, which is my hub for posting all of my things. Please check that out. Please check out all the things, and if you enjoyed this series, please let me know. I will do more videos of the same ilk. I will see you later. Bye! <laughs>